Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining the Institute of South Asian Studies panel discussion on Prime Minister Narendra Modi 2.0, New Directions and Old Challenges. Before we start the event, we would like to request that all participants please keep their microphones muted throughout the session. Following the panel discussion, should you have any questions, please submit them via the general chat to the moderator. The questions will be consolidated for the panelists to answer. Joining us on the panel discussion today are Dr. Rana Joy Sen, Senior Research Fellow and Research Lead, Politics, Society and Governance at the Institute of South Asian Studies in US. Dr. Amitindu Pollitt, Senior Research Fellow and Research Lead, Trade and Economics, Institute of South Asian Studies in US. And Dr. Sinder Paul Singh, Senior Fellow and Coordinator for the South Asia Program at the S. Rajaratnam School of International Studies, NTU. Dr. Diego Mayorano, Visiting Research Fellow at ISAS, will moderate the panel discussion. I shall hand over the session to him. Dr. Diego, please. Thank you, John. And a very warm welcome to all of you from ISIS for this final discussion on Modi 2.0, uh, a year after the 2019 general elections, uh, when um, the BJP won uh, the absolute majority of the seats uh, in parliament for the second time in a row, even improving its seat share and vote share over its um, what was already a very uh, spectacular and remarkable performance in uh, 2014. As those of you who had um, uh, a lighter lunch and are uh, perhaps more awake uh, will have already noticed, um, our speaker today is our expert in three different fields. We have Dr. Singh on foreign policy, uh, Dr. Sen on domestic politics, uh, and Dr. Palit uh, on the economy. Uh, and these are the three areas uh, that we will discuss. Um, I would just say, uh, a very few words uh, on um, as a way of introduction and clearly the first year of the Modi government has not been an easy year in neither of these three areas. Uh, in foreign policy there has been tension with Pakistan in the wake of the constitutional amendment that revoked uh, Jammu and Kashmir's special status in August 2019 um, and we are now seeing uh, um, a prolonged standoff in Ladakh between Indian and Chinese troops. Um, internally, there has been tension surrounding the promulgation of the Citizenship Amendment Act in December last year, which led to uh, quite large um, and widespread protests throughout the country. Um, and the economy has not performed particularly well, with India's GDP growth declining for now three years in a row, uh, something that had not happened since uh, the balance of payment crisis of 1991. And naturally, on top of all of this came the COVID-19 pandemic, which will of course have uh, important repercussion in all um, these three areas. So we hope that today's discussion will bring some ideas and perspective of how the Indian government might tackle such a difficult situation. And we have uh, here three brilliant minds to help us navigate the intricacies, intricacies of the challenges ahead. I will, need, I will not take any more time. Um, each speaker will speak for about 15 minutes um, and um, uh, we will then, uh, um, uh, we will then uh, uh, hand it over uh, to Q&A um, that you can submit, as John said, through the chat function. Uh, thank you once again for joining us and um, I would uh, hand the floor to Dr. Singh. The floor is yours. Um, thank you, Diego. Uh, I want to thank uh, ISIS for uh, making me part of this uh, discussion. Uh, firstly, let me just uh, just say that uh, you know uh, exercises like this are, are somewhat a bit um, a bit difficult because um, when you're trying to assess um, uh, a period of a year um, in the case of the Narendra Modi's uh, second term in government, uh, normally what happens is you end up with the, the usual kind of assessment, some things have changed, some things uh, remain the same. Uh, uh, so in a sense, that's normally the kind of assessment we all end up with. I, I like to, at the start, before I, I got 15 minutes, so I, I, I don't want to spend too much time on introductions, but I think the, for me, the interesting, uh, the interesting point about, about this, this notion of some change and some and some things being you know continuity a continuity from 
not only uh, Modi 1.0, if you must, but a continuity from earlier Indian governments in, in the foreign policy realm is, there was this, uh, between the months of June 2019 and September 2019, uh, there were two different pieces written by two different quite renowned uh, analysts of Indian foreign policy. So in June 2019, Harsh Pant, uh, who's King's College, and now uh, uh, sabbatical, I guess, in ORF in India, wrote a piece in the foreign policy saying how uh, Modi's uh, 2.0 term uh, has set the stage for a huge change in Indian foreign policy. That India no longer would be the country that just relies, uh, places itself as a balancer between the US and China anymore. That India under Modi will try to eke out a, a, a distinct space for itself outside this discourse of India's balancer. And, uh, and then Hush goes on to make uh, uh, his point about how things are different. A few months later, uh, in September, in the same uh, in the same publication, Foreign Policy, uh, Manjari Miller uh, writes an uh, assessment as well as a starting part of the 2.0 Modi 2.0 government, and she has a completely different take on uh, what she sees as Modi's foreign policy at the start of his second term, and she points out the continuities that take place not only from 1.0 but from uh, when you compare it to earlier Indian governments, even Congress governments, she actually goes, Manjri actually goes as far back as Nehru and tries to, to locate this perennial source of Indian unease with forging alliances as, as Modi tries to grow closer to the US, this perennial Indian issue about are we getting too close to somebody keeps bugging India. So Manjri tries to make the point that, you know, this is a huge continuity. The words might change, so how the BJP don't like, doesn't like the term non-alignment, you use another term, but the, 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 that sense is still there. And uh, I think people like Rajamon, for example, will agree and that this is there. And he's one of, the, one of those people who will say that that's something that the Indian state needs to overcome. And Manjari says, Modi can't, he can't overcome that. So having said that as the, the, kind of, the, the kind of debate between change and continuity, I just want to make, I think, three main points. And uh, all of them, I think, are the three key kind of sets of relationships in Indian foreign policy. Uh, I'm not going to talk about Pakistan, and I'll explain very shortly why. Uh, I, don't, I, I think more and more, as uh, Diego sort of hinted, uh, Pakistan is more and more uh, negotiated via the domestic politics of India rather than foreign policy per se. And when it comes to foreign policy, more and more is negotiated via India's attitude and relationship with China. So... I, I can leave that for the Q&A maybe with some questions, but let me go through, I think, three main, uh, three key points, as, as you, if you must. The first is China. Now, what has changed uh, in the last one year? I think the key, the key thing that has changed is if you look at the first term, I think the Modi government, with mean, this discourse that uh, the Modi government when it was opposition and uh, kept saying that the Congress government was too soft on China, right? Every time the Indian state was going to do something, uh, Manmohan Singh got afraid, got cold feet, and he pulled back. So the discourse was, we are going to be very realistic about our relationship with China. China is a strategic competitor, and we are not going to shy away from making decisions that uh, will safeguard our strategic interests. But in the first term, you realize that there was a sense that uh, India wanted to do what most Southeast Asian and East Asian states were doing for a long time. That means be wary of China strategically, but try to build economic links with China at the same time, right? So there was this dual track thing that Southeast Asia had been doing for a long time. Very close um, uh, economic relationships with China, but the defense relationship much less so. So there was a balance of sorts going on. And I think in the first term, the Modi government was trying to go down that path. I think in the last one year, that has taken a very sharp turn. I think there is a sense that this competition cannot be compartmentalized anymore. You cannot say we will have strategic competition and then economics, maybe we can come together. I think the notion now, the, the, the sense is the competition is across all domains. This is an all-out competition across economic, uh, political, diplomatic, strategic, etc. So I see that as one kind of key uh, uh, move in the last year so that there's, there were some voices within India, I think Amit Hindu later will speak about this probably or not, but 
there were earlier there were some voices in india although minority voices which said you know maybe we should think about uh joining the bri you know uh, maybe there's opportunity somewhere for us now those voices are largely i think non existent because the understanding is the competition cannot be put in different compartments anymore and i think whether there's a good or bad thing in terms of normative judgments I, i'm not sure i think the, the the indian state is responding in my view to an increasingly assertive china uh, a china that especially after covid-19 sees itself as reaching a point where there is a window of opportunity to make certain moves that it earlier may not be able to make as easily you see the south china sea for instance and now you seen of course the the the, the continuing uh, border standoff with india so i think in that sense that's one key move the move away from saying we can engage economically and then we can still be competitors in the strategic realm where it doesn't spill into all out war now i think the 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 part about that balance is gone now the the second relationship of course is the us and relationship with the us of course is relational to india's relationship with china right uh, i mean a lot of people may not agree but i think how the, how india deals with the us is always relational to its its its, uh, its relationship with china and i think here there is a split in opinion one strand of opinion thinks that because of chinese assertiveness increasing chinese assertiveness and the seeming realization within the modi regime especially modi government in to, in the in the new in the new administration that there is no way of engaging china anymore not even in economic terms uh we need to get closer to the us so one school of thought looks at india's foreign policy the last one year as increasingly pivoting very strongly especially in the defense uh in the defense realm towards the us so they they point to things like the logistics agreement um etc where things that were completely unthinkable uh uh in the manmohan singh government which dragged the bit but the kind of momentum that it, it picked up so i think that's one strand of opinion that india and the us will move uh much much closer together there are some noises about the trade issues in india and the us but those seem to be muted a bit amit indu probably might speak a bit more about that but that the second strand of opinion is and this is again you you hear it a lot is that india is returning is kind of manjri miller if you want if you must kind of line the india is returning to an age of non alignment that it, it it pivoted to the us quite a bit but then now it's trying to make sure it's balancing this relationship with other relationships so people who argue this line point to you know india buying military equipment from russia still uh, trying to push uh is relationship with iran uh, against us wishes for example buying oil etc so in a sense there are two uh, kind of kind of kind of strands uh, when you talk about the the us in my view i think is for me is a for me is apparent that the pivot is what's happening the, the pivot towards the us in terms of defense relationship and, and 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 i think that is more apparent to me than the seeming return to some type of non alignmentness a uh, indian foreign policy we can we can discuss that in uh in, in the q q and a now the, the third part uh east asia uh south east asia i think here there will be very quickly the three main main issues uh the first one of course is the the the, the big highlight uh is the rcep and uh, india's uh decision uh, at least at this point in time not to sign the rcep and i think met with a huge amount of disappointment in east asia not only south east asia japan as well um i think here again there is there's comes there's a, i i i see a shift in a sense in the sense that and is related to how india wants to deal with china i think given rcep was asean led asean still wants to forgo regionalism how asean has always done it which is you try to forge multilateral institutions that are functionally different in nature but all work together so you got economic multilateralism you got strategic diplomatic multilateralism they all supposed to come together and make everyone you know reduce suspicion get everyone together and it's not a new idea right it's how the european the idea of the eu and functionalism in that literature how you do small things postal union and then you do larger things now i think you come to a point where i don't think india subscribes to that anymore and and that's where the i think the the, the kind of asean india uh, uh divergence starts to appear because i think india used to look like it agreed with that kind of multilateralism but 
I think after the RCEP kind of debacle, I think it shows that India doesn't, doesn't think that that's the kind of materialism that will work when it comes to dealing with China in the region. And related to that, the second point is the, this notion of the Indo-Pacific. Again, there is some amount of divergence. We all know um, uh, the ASEAN kind of position on it and what we see as the American, uh, the, the Indian, the Japanese, uh, the Australian kind of vision of the Indo-Pacific. Again, I think here, ASEAN wants to, wants to build regionalism on past precedent, which is it agrees that the Indo-Pacific is a new strategic geography. I don't think ASEAN countries will say, oh, the Indo-Pacific uh, is, is, as, as, a, as, a, as a nomenclature doesn't work. It does. The problem here is that the distance between India and the Saudi Asian states, for example, is what are you going to do in negotiating this new strategic space called the Indo-Pacific? And of course, ASEAN's view is if you are going to have ad hoc groupings, then everybody must be included. And here's where the Quad becomes a big problem. And also statements made by people like Trump don't help, where the Quad and the Indo-Pacific is put together. And so I think that becomes um, a, a problem for ASEAN. So there again, you can see some amount of divergence. And the last part is, which is uh, about military ties. I think here, the picture is a bit more mixed in the sense that India, especially in the last year, and this is a continuation, I think, from 1.0 is showing a very firm commitment to raising and uh, improving military ties with South Asian and East Asian states, right? And one example, of course, is how India has pushed so hard to be part of the Malacca Straits Patrol, MSP. Uh, India make a case that uh, it, it, the, the Andamans lie at the, at the mouth of the states of Malacca and therefore if joint security or you know, coordinated patrols are being done in the states of Malacca, India should, should be part of it. Here, some countries agree, some countries don't agree, but India, for example, doing a joint military exercise, I think, yeah, India, Thailand, Singapore. And it's a sign of how much this government, and this, of course, starts from one by zero, is willing to push that, that, the defence ties part. Again, this shows that the India, this, this government thinks that the economic multilateralism part may not be working anymore. And this ties in to the last point about what I see uh, uh, as some more recent statements by Prime Minister Modi about, you know, uh, being self-reliant, you know, building your own stuff and uh, domestic manufacturing. And again, there is a contradiction here between the BJP as the party of, you know, of the market uh, and then talking about stuff like, you know, uh, building things at home. But this is not new. There's the Make in India campaign at the start was also about building, uh, building, um, um, building self-reliance economically, manufacturing. So I think here, this feeds into how India sees economic multilateralism uh, in the region, dealing with China. And I think this all fits together in a kind of reversion uh, domestically, a bit more, you know, some parochialness appearing in kind of Indian foreign policy, where before this was the party that embraced, you know, free trade, supposedly. I mean, Amit Edu obviously uh, might... Might, might correct me there, but there was an appearance of a party uh, that embraced the market. Now you see a slightly different type of party. I will stop there, Diego. Thank you so much. Thank you to you, Singapore. And I will now um, turn to uh, Dr. Khalid, who will, I believe, shed some light on the present economic situation in the country. Over to Diego, your you. uh, speaker is off. Would you like to unmute it? Yeah, yeah. We couldn't hear you earlier. Diego, you need to check your mic settings. I think it's running from the laptop. It's not running. Can you can you hear me now? Yeah. Yes, yeah. yes. Yeah. yeah, yes. Now it's yeah. good. Yeah. The floor is yours, Dr. Palette. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Diego. In fact, it's appropriate that we had that little bit of technical disruption because much of what is happening in India on the economic side is being described as technical disruptions, not unintended. But nonetheless, the consequences are turning out to be very profound and far-reaching. Thank you so much, Diego. Thank you, Aisas, for giving me this opportunity. A pleasure to be a part of this panel. Now, I would... Uh, start on the economic reflections with a 
little bit of coverage on what we actually saw during Modi 1.0 because technically 1.0 and 2.0 are still not really comparable in terms of the length of the time they cover in terms of the statistics and data that we have. But nonetheless, there are broad features uh, which we can probably pick up as lessons and then go ahead from there. Modi 1.0 began in the middle of 2014 with what I would describe as uh, emphasis being very strong on five elements of economic policy and management. The first was bringing down the cost of doing business in the Indian economy. And this was aimed to be achieved through a sustained improvement in the ease of doing business ranks. What we have actually seen over the last five to six years is that indeed statistically, when it comes to the World Bank's ease of doing business, which is the most accepted uh, indicator of the ease of doing business across the world, India has made significant improvements. India is now almost at 60 in a group of 180 plus countries, beginning from the time when Modi 1.0 began, where India was just under 140. The second issue, which was prominent with Modi 1.0 in the early years of its first term in office, was actually the effort to address certain factor market imperfections in the economy. And it seems quite distant now to think that actually in the first six months to one year of the Modi government in its first term, there were successive ordinances that were brought in by the government to ensure that some of the major impediments that came into the Land Acquisition Reconstruction Act done by the previous uh, UPA government, and which became major obstacles for inviting private business in terms of the uh, requirements which they imposed on part of business, were actually aimed to be addressed through these ordinances. Subsequently, these ordinances did not last. Subsequently, the Modi government actually gave up pushing on land and land policies, and the matter has actually gone into the depth of the Indian parliamentary consultations and is resting with the consultative committee. The third point that the Modi government set out to do in the 1.0 uh, space was try to take a hard look at India's banks and the financial sector and to tackle the very large number of non-performing loans and assets that were uh, populating the balance sheets of the banks. And let's also not forget the fact that in a sense, these bad loans were a reflector of what has come to be commonly known as crony capitalism in the context of India. And the Modi campaign that got him to office was to a large extent targeted towards the crony capitalism and its control. So it was imperative that the government goes out and chases defaulters, whether it's been successful in getting the defaulters back to the country and so on and so forth, it's a different matter. But that signal was important to go. And at the same time, there were also legislative moves, uh, primarily in terms of the insolvency and bankruptcy code that came in for tackling banking defaults. Two other areas of emphasis in 1.0. First, there were efforts to expand the benefits of the direct benefit transfer scheme. This was introduced by the Congress-led UPA government in terms of direct transfer of subsidies uh, to the beneficiaries through the banking system. Modi government made efforts to consolidate this, connecting them to Aadhaar, connecting them to the Jan Dhan Yojana scheme in terms of allowing the poor people to open up uh, balance uh, zero balance bank accounts and to directly transfer a large number of benefits to them. And the final point that I would like to uh, bring up over here is that there was also an effort, I would say a welcome effort from a public finance point of view to actually rationalize some of the subsidies, which have been a major drag on the uh, central government federal finances, primarily the petroleum subsidies, uh, to ensure that they are targeted better. Now, these, I would broadly say, were the five prominent components of Modi 1.0 in the first two years or 30 months of its tenure. 
something happened in December or November 2016, and that was the act of demonetization of the Indian currency. Subsequent to demonetization, a number of things changed in terms of the perspective and in terms of the way the government went about managing the economy. I would say that broadly what we finally end up with when the Modi government sought a vote for a second entry into office was actually a focus, a very strong and prominent focus on populist welfare schemes funded entirely out of public exchequer. Now, why did this come to happen? Number one, I think demonetization was a game changer. Demonetization, why it was done, the ostensible reasons for that can be argued. It has been extensively debated. But I think what the demonetization experience brought out very clearly was the Indian economy's enormous connection and intricate dependence on the informal sector. The Indian economy is by and large even today informalized. And more than 80% of India's workers, the workforce, are informal. And they have not been able to be included into the formal workspace. And for these people, the economy cannot really formalize or the economy cannot institutionally transform in a way which would produce the character of an OECD economy. The cost of that formalization is phenomenal. Phenomenal to the extent that not they would jobs go, but they would also spill over into huge social crises, political fallouts, and economic challenges. And this was also the time when this realization came on the back of a number of state elections coming up in India. The BJP was keen on cementing its perpetuity across the Indian Federation, and the owners clearly shifted to safeguarding constituencies across the country, primarily comprising of informal workers, marginal farmers, so on and so forth. So they, they started uh, into a process of large rollouts of public support. And slowly, the first two years of considerable amount of robustness in economic reforms, or at least the attempts to push towards economic reforms, gave way to a greater populist, welfare-oriented, support. Now, I think there's also, along with this shift, which, which could be driven by the pressures of domestic political economy, there was also this implicit realization, a realization which dawned on many much later, probably just as uh, the country went into elections, maybe during the uh, month of December, November of 2018, and just the period thereafter. But before that itself, I think the government realized right in the aftermath of the demonetization experience that the country was actually slowly, in terms of a GDP growth trajectory, getting into a period of steady slowdown. And this slowdown was structural. It was not a cyclical factor. It was not a one-off episode. It was a result of various imperfections in the economy having been compounded in such a way that this large informal sector, which has happened to maintain the economy at a certain level of consumption for several years, in the process generating income, some investment, and also sustaining themselves, was gradually running out of steam. Sectors that were pushing the economy towards some kind of 7% plus growth primarily real estate, construction, housing, hospitality, were actually running out of steam. So the only way of sustaining the economy at whatever baseline it was possible was to actually go back to the kind of schemes that was first um, implemented by Dr. Manmohan Singh in 2005 with the National Rural Employment Guarantee Act. That eventually turned out to be the model for pushing more and more income into the hands of people through a large number of other schemes, simply because this structural slowdown had no answer. It is not a problem typical of India. It's a problem which is surrounding several emerging market economies across the world. But this, in an Indian context, created a peculiar scenario where the push towards 
very large, intensive public welfare driven uh, expenditure and economic management policy also brought in another peculiar change. And this change was a, was a slogan, was a focus, was a dedication towards self-reliance. Now, the problem with this argument is that to an extent, this came out of a view that much of what has gone wrong with India is actually a result of its economic policies taken in the past, which encouraged greater integration with the world economy. Again, India is probably not the only country and its government is not the only government which subscribes to such views. There are countries across the world and there are political and economic communities within those who do subscribe to such views that globalization, greater global integration has had more victims than beneficiaries. But in India, this somehow tended to gather traction and it actually manifested in a very sharp and prominent form as soon as Modi 2.0 began, which began at a time when there was an implicit recognition of the slowdown in the economy that began at a time when the realization was very much there that jobs are going, informal sector jobs are not coming back. There is a general tendency of technological structuring within the economy, which is taking away jobs. And other than that, there are also not enough impetuses coming from within the economy to keep the job intensive sectors growing. Now, on the back of that realization, the government right from the time when it took charge in May 2019 actually started unleashing a series of steps towards supporting the vulnerable sections of the community in whatever form they could. So this meant a continuation of the second part of Modi 1.0, which meant a focus on populist welfare policies. But then something else happened. There was probably a realization of the fact that the government needed to come out with answers. Simply putting money into the systems is not good enough. Maybe there are very difficult answers to be obtained. Maybe there are very difficult decisions to be taken. But the chorus kept building that nothing's happening. The business confidence index is falling. Exports are falling. Shutters are coming down. Jobs are going. Why is all this happening? And again, this actually led to a situation where some amount of economic nationalism started building up in a prominent way. The reflection started going in a substantial fashion on India's external engagement, particularly the trade engagement, leading to something which is almost unbelievable. India backed out of this RCEP consultations after having been engaged in those for more than seven years and after having gone through 28 rounds. Now, the clear irony over here is that it was the Modi government who, through its 1.0, kept engaged in RCEP. And it wouldn't have stayed engaged with the process unless and until it visualized clear economic and strategic benefits. But then suddenly, four months, five months into the 2.0, it backed out. Obviously, there were domestic compulsions which became so enormous that it had to take a decision to back out. But the challenge for the government was to actually establish a counter narrative that staying out of RCEP, withdrawing from external engagement, reviewing trade agreements will actually produce results of a better economic paradigm, which is primarily focused on economic self-sufficiency, whether one critically describes it as economic nationalism or not is a different point of view altogether. But this economic self-sufficiency narrative has actually today reached a point where, as my uh, friend and colleague Dr. Singh earlier mentioned, it has led to a situation where India is committed towards a strategy of very selective engagement as far as trade is concerned. And the broader pattern of greater engagement with the trade and investment community is increasingly being discouraged. And I also would tend to suggest that this, in a sense, probably reflects a certain degree of deep distrust and suspicion over countries across the world 
in several regions and parts which have benefited from trade continue to voice the benefits of staying engaged in trade and free trade agreements primarily in Southeast Asia as opposed to India which while having benefited from trade never takes it to a level of political legitimacy always continues to stay defensive on the subject of trade bringing up subjects of bilateral deficit very similar to what we are getting to see in the United States of America in terms of a focus on trade at this point in time now what we have in Modi 2.0 is COVID-19 now COVID-19 I would say has uh, created a very complicated policy perspective scenario in a sense COVID-19 is a completely new animal none of the world really has any clue as to how this can be damaged or controlled each country has moved on it in its own respective fashion maybe learning by doing maybe kind of experimenting on a large number of containment strategies and uh, associated factors for india the problem of covid is multifarious it has public health dimensions it has economic dimensions it has social dimensions going ahead it has political dimensions because soon enough a time will come when as indians get realized to live in with covid political regimes at least at the state government level will start getting tested on their performance in managing covid and there could be political cost to be paid and that's uppermost on the minds of a number of state governments well the central government doesn't yet come to that point and that is why there is an interesting optimism which is there in the central government when it comes to assessment of economic opportunities as opposed to the state governments in India. Prime Minister Modi and his team has been continuously for the last almost one month suggesting that let's convert COVID into an opportunity. You don't see that coming up from the state governments except for ad hoc decisions coming out from certain BJP ruled state governments primarily the reason being that the central government today can utilize COVID as an opportunity for implementing very difficult political and economic changes which it has through examples like amending the essential commodities act simply because it does not have to be scared about a political fallout state governments can't as a result of which the onus again has been on the central government the central government has acted it might continue giving signals to the state governments that look covid something which can help you to clean up your act get the factor markets going put in the land policies in place clear out the uh, labor law in terms of uh, a balanced labor market character but whether the state governments would play ball or not is a very difficult situation so my sense is today the Modi 2.0 actually in a unique sense presents a period of opportunity it presents a period of opportunity because if legitimacy is the objective and from where the Indian economy is right now there can only be a turning around if the right push is provided so combined with political legitimacy regime legitimacy and economic imperatives the central government actually has the opportunity of going where many Indian governments in the recent past have not been able to because it does have that clear political support behind it in both houses of the parliament to go through legislations. It's already changed the Essential Commodities Act through ordinances, something which we really don't get to see in an Indian political policy and economic making, uh, policy making spectrum. So that possibility exists. The challenge for the Modi government, real significant challenge, will be to carry the state governments along with them because the state governments have been much more on the firing line on COVID performance as opposed to the central government. But this is going to be a very interesting period of three years and more to look forward to. Thank you, David. Thank you, Amitendu. And um, Amitendu, um, as usual, I would say, ended up with a political note uh, to, its, uh, to his economic analysis. And this is a nice introduction to um, Dr. Sen, who will now turn to domestic politics. Rana Joy, floor is yours.
Thank you, Diego. Uh, I try and wrap up my comments within 15 minutes so that we have some time for the Q and A. As someone had remarked the other day, the uh, the first year of Narendra Modi's second term, or Modi 2.0, as many of us are calling it, can be divided into two phases. Uh, one could be called before coronavirus BC, and the other after coronavirus AC. So in my comments, I'll look first at some of the important milestones and trends in the first eight months or so, the BC phase of Modi's second term. And second, I'll look at the Modi government's response to the COVID-19 crisis or the AC phase, which has of course been alluded to by Amitendu in the, in the earlier presentation. And finally, I'll raise a few questions on the, the short to medium impact of these policies on Indian politics and governments. Um, there's little doubt that the BJP's uh, political, cultural, and social agenda took precedence in the first six months or so of Modi's second term. These, of course, included the government's move to abrogate Article 370 and uh, revoke Kashmir's Jammu and Kashmir special status in August 2019. It also passed a legislation criminalizing the practice of instant triple talaq, which of course had already been outlawed by India Supreme Court earlier. And in finally, in end 2019, amending the, the Citizenship Act, or which is often known by the, the acronym CAA, the Citizenship Amendment Act, Act Amendment. All these were quite prominently uh, mentioned by Modi in a letter that he wrote to Indian citizens on, on May the 30th, which completed the formal completion of one year of his second term. He also interestingly mentioned the, the Ram Temple at Ayodhya, the issue that uh, catapulted the BJP into prominence in the 1990s, which was of course facilitated by the, the long delayed Supreme Court judgment in, in November, sanctioning a temple where the Babri Masjid once stood in Ayodhya. Um, all these were, were uh, listed of course, in, in the BJP's 2019 election manifesto and have been a staple uh, in the party's previous manifestos too. Uh, Modi, upon returning to power in, in May of last year, was thus using his, his strong mandate to push items that had been on the long-standing agenda of the BJP, which the other government, uh, with the earlier BJP government, had not been able to do for various reasons. One critical aspect that enabled Modi to accomplish these feats was the fact that since the 2019 general election, the BJP not only had an overwhelming majority in the lower house of the Lok Sabha, it would also muster numbers in the indirectly elected upper house or the Rajya Sabha, where it had more members, willing allies, and a very fragmented opposition. So all these factors in fact helped uh, uh, the, the, the BJP and Modi to push through uh, on, on, on its agenda, which it had not been able to do so earlier. In addition, there was hardly any significant domestic opposition to a majority of these acts, with several regional parties, as well as some prominent members of the Congress, siding with the BJP on these issues. It was only on the CAA, which was also linked to the controversial National Registry of Citizens NRC that provoked widespread protests. In cities across India in, in 2019, thousands came out to protest the CAA, which was seen as discriminatory towards Muslims, as well as the NRC, which some feared could be used to disenfranchise certain groups. This was by far the largest pan-Indian protest that the Modi government had faced, and one that also partially gathered strength due to the severity of the police crackdown on protesters. However, because this was largely a civil society reaction or response, it was also one that was difficult to sustain. So by the time violence broke out around the protests in parts of Delhi in February this year, and which quickly took a communal turn, the protests were indeed dying down. The government's handling of the riots and the subsequent investigation along with the earlier policies that I just mentioned, has fueled some criticism both within and outside India that the government was following a majoritarian agenda. 
Arguably, these policies were being pursued despite the economy showing serious signs of a downturn, which uh, Amit Hindu referred to earlier. Ironically also, these policies did not pay much dividends in the state elections that were held after the general elections in, in late 2019 and early 2020. So since the 2019 general elections, the BJP was in fact unable to form the government in Maharashtra, though it was the single largest party with 122 odd seats. It was convincingly defeated in both Delhi and the eastern state of Jharkhand and was barely able to form the government in Haryana with the help of a regional party. This underlined the dichotomy between central and state elections on one hand, the issues that animate voters, as well as the impact of, of Modi's charisma vis-a-vis uh, -vis the general and the state elections. To come to the to the the the, the BC the 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 the, the, the after COVID nineteen phase, um, as in most countries, after the COVID nineteen pandemic struck, the Gov the Modi government has been focused on tackling the crisis. The the nationwide lockdown announced by Modi on March 24th at uh, literally four hours notice and subsequently extended several times till the end of May was typical of the bold moves that Modi prefers. That the lockdown, the largest in terms of scale and in, in, to some extent stringency in the world was largely successful, they implemented is testimony to Modi's popularity as well as the hold he has over a majority of Indians. By labeling the threat of the virus as a war, demanding sacrifices of the Indian people, and invoking Indian epics like the Mahabharat, Modi adroitly rallied the country around the flag. In fact, some surveys taken around the time, March, April, showed that Modi's handling of the crisis had indeed enhanced his popularity. So he was not only able to make most people stay at home for an excellent period, but he also got them to unite at selected moments. And this was something that Modi mentioned in his letter to the citizens. And maybe I'll just quote one line from that where he says, and I'm quoting Modi, be it clapping and lighting a lamp to the Janta curfew, that is the people's curfew, or by faithful adherence to rules during the nationwide lockdown, on every occasion you, that is a citizen, have shown that Ek Bharat, that is one India, is the guarantee for stretched Bharat or Great India. The lockdown, though, was not without its problems. Now, the biggest failings was not taking into account or at least underestimating the impact on migrant workers who bore the brunt of the lockdown, with literally millions stranded either in the place of work or on the highways, and in fact, some of them dying on the way back home from hunger, illness, accidents, etc. It was only when the media and some chief ministers highlighted the plight that the Indian state then swing into action providing succor first for shelter and food and later transportation by way of buses and then several trains which were dubbed the shamik or the laborer uh, worker trains. I'm not really qualified to go into whether the lockdown did work or not. However, there is consensus that a lockdown was needed and it saved lives, though the numbers are, are disputed as is the case in most countries. It is also clear that the post-lockdown situation has been far messier and the number of daily cases in India has risen over the past few days. However, India till date has done quite well on cases per capita and the critical case fatality ratio, that is number of deaths per 100 cases. India, in fact, earlier this week was ranked 143rd in the world in the former, that is uh, cases per capita and its CFR still remains very low, 2.8% compared to the global CFR, CFR of 5.8%. Finally, looking ahead, uh, the government's attention per force has to be on reviving the economy. Again, this was something that Amit Hindu talked about. Um, and of course, there was a, a serious economic package that Modi announced. On politics and governance, a few issues could be flagged. One, do we see a BJP system or a second dominant party system in place similar to the Congress system of Europe? Two, what will be the repercussions of the pandemic 
on Indian federalism, which is already under stress due to the pandemic. And again, this is something that Amitendu did mention. Three, Modi's call for an Atmanirbhar Bharat or self-reliant India while announcing the economic package on, on 12th May. And its contours, both economic and political, will be of particular interest in the near future. Four, welfare schemes. Again, this is something that Amitendu mentioned which is one of the reasons behind the BJP spectacular victory in 2019, is likely to be continued to be expanded, especially in light of the economic devastation caused by the pandemic. Uh, and, uh, you know, there's, finally, I should also mention that, uh, um, you know, there's been some talk of, of an abatement of conventional politics uh, uh, in the wake of the pandemic. And there have been several articles which, which talked about uh, this issue. But it will also be argued uh, conversely that the way the crisis was being handled was itself uh, political. There was a concerted effort by the central government to show that the pandemic, particularly the number of infections and fatalities, were under control and by state governments to do the same. There have also been intense politics over the handling of the, the migrant issue. Over the past few years, however, we are seeing politics return to some normalcy with uh, Home Minister Amit Shah having addressed party workers in three virtual rallies. So this is a nod to the, the new uh, uh, dynamics in place due to COVID-19, with two of these virtual rallies being in Bihar and West Bengal states, which go to election uh, next. And in, these, in the last one, which was uh, uh, in fact done, conducted yesterday, to party workers, BJP party workers in West Bengal. They were barbs aimed at Bengal Chief Minister Mamata Banerjee, who's reeling from the twin blows of the pandemic and the devastating cyclone. Clearly, the BJP election machine is once again up and running. Like time, I guess, it waits for no man, or in this case, no woman, as well as a pandemic. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Ronajoy. And um, this um, uh, brings us to uh, the Q&A uh, part of our uh, discussion. So um, I would encourage uh, you in the public to uh, submit your questions through the chat, uh, and then we will collect them and um, I will pose them to the audience on my behalf. But in the meantime, I will um, abuse of my power uh, of moderator to pose um, one question for each of the panelists myself that I would encourage you to respond to briefly so that we can then turn to questions from, uh, from the public. Um, one question for um, Sinderpal um, from um, a completely uh, ignorant of foreign policy issues um, is that um, um, your, uh, you, you, you said that um, India's moved towards a closer relationship with the US. Um, and my question would be, is this at least partly due to the realization that uh, uh, in India's foreign policy circles, that uh, at this stage, there cannot be true competition between India and China? If we look at um, uh, GDP per capita, uh, China's GDP per capita is five times larger than India's, which is a difference which is similar in scale to that between uh, the US and Mexico. Um, so is this part of a kind of realization that, you know, what competition can we actually, how can we compete? To Amitendu, um, again, to my non-expert view, uh, Modi's uh, government stimulus package in the wake of the COVID pandemic has mainly targeted the supplied side of the economy. Um, whereas my understanding is that um, both the pre-COVID uh, or uh, pre-COVID-19 uh, economic situation or economic crisis, and especially the post uh, COVID-19 economic crisis um, is largely a demand side uh, issue. So how uh, would you agree with this, uh, with this uh, brief analysis? And to um, Rona Joy, um, my reading again is that uh, uh, Modi, as you mentioned, might actually benefit in the short term uh, from the uh, round the flag effect, what political scientists call round the flag effect. Um, and state governments, on the other hand, are actually taking the burden um, of 
many problems caused by central government decisions, especially, um, for example, the management of the um, internal migrants uh, during the um, lockdown. Um, what impacts do you foresee this will have in uh, West Bengal and uh, Bihar? I know this is unfair because you actually posed this question yourself, uh, but um, I would like to hear your prediction. Thank you. Hi. Uh, so they're going to be. I go. Uh, I go first. Um, I, fair question. I think. I. I think that's one. We, we look at the trajectory. Try very brief. Uh, respond very briefly. We look at the trajectory. Um, from the from the from the end of the Cold War. Uh, this, if you look at a lot of analysis done on this, the the India-China difference economically, the, the economic base, the growth, etc. And the military budgets, especially, the difference wasn't that significant. But from there till now, the difference has grown. So, I mean, in IR terms, there are two ways uh, to deal with someone who you see as being a threat to you. A is something called internal balancing, which means you grow your own, you, you, you develop your own military resources, right? You spend more on your military as a way of dealing with a threat, or external balancing, that means you find friends who can sit on your side and then serve as a counterbalance. So I guess India is trying to do both. The internal balancing, of course, the problem is the pie is finite. So how much you give to defense and how much you give to every other you know, uh, uh, policy imperative that Modi has uh, is going to be. So externally, the US looks uh, to be the, the moving towards US seems to be the only kind of practical uh, uh, position. The problem, of course, is, and Manjuri, to some extent, is right, that there is a deep set, still, I think, a deep set anti-Americanism within large sections of the bureaucracy. And as much as earlier analysis said that the Congress had a deeper um, anti-Americanism, the BJP ranks had a deeper anti chinese than an anti-Americanism, there's still a very deep anti-Westernism running within BJP circles. And again, they need convincing because America has shown again and again to be a very fickle partner uh, when it comes to allies. So in a sense, there's always a constant renegotiation. So I guess India also looks to other partners. So Japan, Australia, the East Asian countries, these are the kind of, in a way, trying to hedge your relationship. So if the American one doesn't go really well, you've got other friends as well. But you are right, the American one is the key relationship to forge as China and the, in the Gulf grows. Thank you, I'm attending to you. Diego, I think uh, by now we have a fairly clear understanding about the kind of uh, the economic support or otherwise described as stimulus package that's been uh, announced by the government. Now, I, I would just like to distinguish between uh, the the two uh, notions which are doing the rounds, the support versus the stimulus. What we have actually got to see is mainly support. Now, that is not unusual because that's what most governments across the world did get to mobilize as their first order reactions. Identify the businesses and the people who are going to be most hard hit as a result of the containment strategies they are following and then address their short-term difficulties in as effective a fashion as possible. You're absolutely right when you describe it as a primarily supply-side phenomenon because what the government has essentially tried to do is to put money into the hands of the people, let's say over a period of three months, four months, five months, as much as possible into the different groups that it has identified. Uh, they could be migrant labor, they could be uh, the agricultural labor, they could be uh, the women in the poor households. In a large number of cases, these are overlapping categories. But what we really don't have in what has come out till now is a measure or a strategy for kick-starting the economy, which has to be primarily investment-driven. There has to be substantial doses of investment coming in from the government for beginning projects that got held up or commencing projects that are new 
and can generate a kind of economic multiplier effect that will bring in a large number of displaced workers into its fold. I think this is where there is a substantial concern as to whether ultimately what is put on the table is going to take the Indian economy out of the kind of morass that it finds itself in. Because frankly, my assessment is that given the kind of emphasis that the Modi government has had over the last two to three years on a primarily public welfare enhancing populist strategy, the government has really emptied itself in terms of reserves, in terms of resources. It really doesn't have much with which it can kickstart the economy because those funds are going to be of an uncertain nature. I mean, I, I remember this uh, very honest admission that came out of the Minister for Food, uh, Mr. Pass, uh, Consumer Affairs and Food, uh, on a television interview when he said that, look, I can't open up the entire granary for providing free food rations because I don't know how long this pandemic is going to last. And if I today open up the entire granary for feeding the volume of migrant workers that are just in the city of Delhi, what am I going to do six months later if the pandemic continues or comes back in second place? So we are living in an exceptionally uncertain time and any effort to provide investment stimulus to the economy has to be uncertain, has to be based on the assumption that this must come out of very deep pockets. I am doubtful whether the Indian economy has that capacity. In fact, you'd recall that uh, about a couple of months ago, when the Economist put out this late article based on the Oxford University's containment strategy government policy tracker, we saw on that index that Indian lockdown was among the most stringent in the world. But did India have the financial or economic capacity for affording that kind of a stringent lockdown? That's the question I think which is uppermost on the minds of the people now. I mean, even today, what we are getting to see is actually a phenomenal shortage of capacities, where the Delhi deputy chief minister is coming out and saying that we need 80,000 beds for treating the COVID-19 patients by the end of another month. Now, which again reflects not just a question of capacity in terms of the physical scaling, but purely in terms of the resources. There's no single state government till now which has been compensated for the resources that it is demanding from the center. And I really seriously doubt whether the central government can do much more than what it has done till now. I might sound cynical, but I think that's the actual state of central public finances in the country. And Diego, thanks uh, for your interesting question. Um, the first part, I entirely agree with you. I think Modi did benefit from the, you know, what is called often the rally around the flag effect. And the general perception that the lockdown itself was effective, not only in keeping people indoors, most people uh, off the streets, but also in containing the spread of the virus. Uh, and the post lockdown phase, I think, has really been delegated, or at least the perception is that it's the state's that now have to take care. And as I mentioned, this has been far more chaotic, far more messier. And in that sense, uh, uh, the state governments and the actions and its abilities uh, uh, come off poorly vis-a-vis -vis, you know, Modi's and the central government's very decisive lockdown decision. So I think that uh, is, is the point is well taken. On your second, uh, and, uh, 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 on the impact of, of, of this on the, the coming two sort of two big state elections. First in Bihar, which has to be done by the end of the year, and West Bengal, which is likely to be early to middle next year. Um, in, 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 in Bihar, I think the BJP anyway is in, 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 a, uh, in a relatively good position, given its, its alliance with uh, Nitish Kumar and the opposition being in a complete state of disarray. Um, so I think, uh, you know, despite what's happening in the state, despite the numbers in Bihar currently actually rising with the return of a lot of migrant laborers, these of course will be issues, but it might not pose a serious problem to the BJP's electoral challenges. In, in West Bengal, of course, 
the surprise that the BJP is in after for a, uh, for a while. We did see a dramatic increase of the number of seats that the BJP won in West Bengal in, in, in the 2019 general election. And that's going to be a bitterly contested election. I think you know, some have even suggested that the, the CAA, the Amendment to the Citizen, Citizenship Act, was partly directed at, uh, at the elections in West Bengal. I think that's a bit of a stretch. But uh, uh, in West Bengal, I think the, the handling of the coronavirus, the, the migrant labor issue, all these are going to play a significant role. In fact, we see a foreshadowing of that in yesterday's uh, virtual rally that uh, Amit Shah held. In fact, he did criticize uh, uh, Mamata Banerjee on several occasions. And one of the things that he criticized her for was apparently calling the, 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 the trains uh, that would bring back the laborers, which are, are, are dubbed the Shamik Expresses. Uh, Amit Shah alleged that apparently Mamata had called them the Corona Express, implying that she was afraid of West Bengal migrants coming back because she felt that they would spread uh, COVID-19. So I think the, the, the issue of handling of COVID-19, the issue of migrant labor, etc., all these are going to be uh, uh, very much at play in, 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 in the West Bengal uh, elections and the lead up to it. Of course, the results, you know, I wouldn't hazard a guess uh, at this moment, but all I can say is it's going to be a very bitterly contested and unfortunately, it could even be quite a violent run up to the election next year. Thank you, uh, Thank you Ronald. Uh, so we have um, quite a few questions coming up. Um, one, I would ask again one to each of you. And uh, to uh, Sinderpal, uh, several um, members of the audience ask about this India-US relationship. Uh, and um, Ankush, Ankush uh, Wagel, for example, uh, ask you to speculate on uh, uh, the future of this relationship uh, if Trump is re-elected next year. Um, and, uh, but, but there are other uh, questions uh, as well on the topic. And uh, Nishan Rajiv, for example, um, argues that in the pre after the great financial crisis, Indian policy elites put the relationship with the US on the back burner um, as they saw US power waning. And uh, COVID-19 could be another uh, instance of the US, uh, well, could have as a consequence the US uh, power being challenged or being perceived to be seriously challenged. Uh, how do you see this uh, playing out in the in the US relationship? Um, on Amitendu, we have a question from Christian Wagner, um, and uh, it's very nicely put. Uh, will self-reliance be a solution for India's economic problems or continue the problems of its economic development? Um, and to Amit uh, and to Rona Joy, uh, we have a question. Let me retrieve it. Yes, um, uh, Aditya Singh uh, um, asked uh, that you have previously written a lot on the Supreme Court of India, and he would like you to comment on uh, the recent performance of the courts. Um, he points out that several commentators have drawn parallels um, to the court's abdication of power during the emergency. Uh, what is your view on the court's um, performance uh, in key decisions, uh, from uh, the Ayodhya decision to the refusal to hear a BS Corpus petition in Kar Kashmir to the petition uh, regarding the plight uh, of migrant workers during the lockdown? Hi, uh, thanks, Diego. I try to address, I saw a couple, I think, uh, Christian Wagner also asked about the Quad, I think, sort of fits in into, I guess, uh, the, the kind of collective question that you, you pose based on the questions asked. I think the, the, with Trump, the, 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 the surface level reading of, of, of the situation is that uh, the Modi-Trump relationship is one of the best relationship between an Indian leader and an American leader. But if you just scratch the surface a bit, I think the major issues largely to do with Trump's own, for lack of a better word, style. Um, for example, during the, the border standoff, Trump basically lied and said that he gave uh, India a call when he did not. And this really pissed the Indians off because he, he was trying to say, I can mediate between the two. Uh, and I, there are also other kind of uh, incidences when the two of them meet where I think there is some worry on the Indian side about when Trump says something and promises something, is he actually going to do it or, 
or not. So the notion of reliability is a big issue, I think, with Trump. Um, the earlier kind of, especially within India, there's this, well, this, this notion that, oh, great, finally we have an American president who's hard on China. That feeling seems to be slowly dissipating when you realize that, as I said, Trump's reliability is a big problem. And, and a lot of people argue that if Trump is looking for a deal, the person, one of the countries that will suffer the most would be India. Because if Trump cuts a deal with China, if some big deal with China, uh, Indian interests are not going to be part of the consideration for Trump. So again, now that is coming to the fore. Just quickly about whether Trump, I think, again, normally India favors Republican presidents. That's been kind of rule. Um, Democrats, India feels uh, are not hard on China enough, talk too much about human rights and nuclear proliferation, etc. But I think in the American political class now, you notice that everyone's got to be hard on China. Biden cannot afford to be less hard on China than and Trump, for example. So I think the, the, the position towards China will continue. And if in American policy towards India is driven or relational to or dependent on American policy towards China, which I believe to a large extent it is, then I guess the difference wouldn't be much. It might improve in terms of the kind of reliability of the American president to do what he or she actually says he or she going to do. So that's, uh, that's why. And the quad uh, question and the America declining power, I think the problem here is, uh, again, this goes kind of, kind of basic IR kind of thing. So do you balance, uh, do you just bandwagon or do you balance, do you just join? I think even though America is a declining power, the, the other option would be for India to join China. You can't. The, I think India and China have interests that cannot be resolved through dialogue. This is not a situation where there's misunderstanding there. If we sit down for about 10 rounds, things will be resumed. No. There's a fundamental clash of interests. There's zero-sum interests and they cannot be resolved by just sitting down. These two countries are separate competitors. So therefore, I think there is the only option India has is to grow much closer to the US, declining power or not. Again, whether declining power, I think a lot of people disagree with that characterization. Relatively speaking, yes, but still, the notion of US as a declining power is, is again, uh, I think some people will, will, will say that's not probably true. And last one about Quad. I think the Quad problem is, arises from the fact that although all the four countries have serious apprehensions about China's behavior and what China wants to do, each of them have various kind of perceptions about what to do about that threat. That led to the first quad, uh, you know, closing shop. And again, you see, I mean, it's very different. Australia's position on China and what it should do. Uh, India's position, the US position. The US got a lot of other fish to fry. The, China is not the only bigger main threat to the US. It's got the Middle East. It thinks Iran is a threat for Trump. Uh, it's got other things to do. And so that distracts the US in terms of dealing with China and the Quad. And then, of course, Japan, how Japan wants to deal with China. Japan thinks RCEP is a very good idea. India doesn't think so. So once again, within the four, you have very different ideas on how to deal with the Chinese threat. It's not enough to identify the same threat. The more important thing is you need to have some convergence on how to deal with the threat. So I'm not... I, I think the same kind of the, the, the level of interaction on Quad, which is now I think at the secretary level, if I'm not mistaken, uh, will probably continue. It's a signaling device to China. If you keep doing bad things, we might up this. But I, 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 I'm, not, I'm not very optimistic about what the Quad can do instead of being institutionalized, doing some really important things. I'm not, I, I'm quite, I'm not very optimistic. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Amitendu, to you, please. Diego, uh, this question about self-reliance, I think technically speaking from a conceptual point of view, every country wants to be self-reliant. No country really wants to have an enormous dependence on external factors, external situations. But I think in India's case, the current narrative of self-reliance is essentially reflecting a concept which would amount to producing everything within India's borders. 
And I think this is where self-reliance actually runs into a serious problem of realization of the way uh, the world is functioning. Uh, for example, there are, there, there are occasions, there are sectors where in spite of import dependence, a country can well be self-reliant depending upon the character of the production network and the supply chain. India imports almost 70% of the crude oil that it uses, but it has more than 100% capacity when it comes to processing of the crude oil into petroleum products, and it's an exporter of petroleum products. So whether India can be self-reliant in terms of something like crude oil or not is a question that depends on the perspective that one takes. Today, this entire debate is focused on the fact that there needs to be much lesser dependency on China. India is not the only country which is thinking on those lines. As a result of that, the supply chains need to become shorter and prominent parts of those, if possible, all of those should be onshored and located within oneself or if not within oneself, then at least with a friendly group of countries. The problem that arises here, and this is where India is going to run into some complications, is that how do you get industries to come out of China? If that is going to happen not on efficiency grounds, but on geopolitical grounds, then the industries would demand compensation for moving from one location which is more efficient to another which is less efficient. There are businesses which have gone back in terms of locating significant parts of their protection in the United States of America from China, but that's largely because of the incentives that have been offered to them, economic and fiscal incentives. So this is where India runs into the incentives game. While all this talk about the relocation of supply chains is going on, we notice quietly Vietnam goes ahead and finishes a free trade agreement with the European Union. So there is no reason why in terms of trade structure, trade policy, rules of business, and the conditions for business, one can accept India to be an automatic choice for relocation. It could be an obvious choice, but it is certainly not an automatic choice. And that is where the notion of self-reliance needs to be backed by pragmatism. Thank you, Amitendu, and Rana Joy to you, please. Yeah. Uh, yeah. On the question of the, you know, of 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 several commentators raising the the question or the issue of the Supreme Court abdicating its 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 power and you know, drawing parallels to the emergency, I think that might be uh, a bit of a stretch. But I think we definitely see the Supreme Court not being as assertive or activist as it usually is, and it has a long history of activism, particularly from the post. Uh, uh, Indira Gandhi uh, in the post Indira Gandhi era, um, so I think that's uh, something that is to be noted. Um, in fact, one could even point to the the the, the issue of uh, you know the former Chief Justice Ranjan Gogoi being appointed to the or being nominated to the Rajya Sabha very quickly you know, within a you know, couple of months after retirement to the to the upper house of the Rajya Sabha which, uh, if nothing else, I think sends the wrong signals. This has happened earlier. In fact, very famously, Chief Justice Ranganath Mishra, um, who had sort of given a clean chit to Rajiv Gandhi during the uh, 1984 uh, uh, Delhi riots, uh, was uh, uh, later appointed, ironically, the National Human Rights Commission chairperson, and subsequently also given a spot in the Rajasthan. So these Precedents are there, uh, and I think this has to also be seen in the larger context of uh, the undermining, to a certain degree, of the independence of institutions in general. Again, this is something that has happened before, particularly when you've had a very strong executive, notably under Mrs. Indira Gandhi, and we are seeing a little bit of that uh, going on, not just in the last year, but I would say going back to the, 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 the first tenure of the, the Modi government. Thank you, Ronald Joy. We have um, time for a last round of questions for each of you, but please keep your answers to two minutes so that we can wrap up 
uh, on time. Um, one question for um, uh, Sinderpal uh, comes from Rupal Nagda and um, asking, well, I uh, changed it a little bit, but the question is interesting. Um, how will uh, India manage relationship with other SARC countries, especially um, the small one that have been um, under the increasing influence of China? Will the COVID pandemic uh, increase such a dependency given that there will be uh, a big economic fallout in all of these countries? Um, then um, we have a question for um, Amitendu as well. Um, sorry, which I can... Can, oh yes, um, does the, uh, the uh, do you think that uh, it is now the moment for Modi among the reforms that might be taken because of the legitimacy and uh, the occasion and uh, exploiting the crisis to make it an opportunity, as you mentioned, do you think this will be the moment to solve the uh, big problem in the financial sectors that India has? Um, and uh, uh, for Rona Joy, um, there is a question uh, of the relationship between the central and the states and do you think that um, this crisis will be um, the last um, the last drop so to speak uh, in a very stressed uh, relationship um, if we think of the very large um, economic liabilities that the states will face in the next months and the increasing um, centralization of power in the hands of the central government thank you Thanks, Diego. Uh, two minutes. Okay. Um, interesting question. Thank you. Uh, I, in my, I mean, firstly, in, in the SARC countries, minus Pakistan, all this, uh, the, the rest of them traditionally have tried to, you know, get the best of both worlds between, between India and, and, and China. So again, uh, nothing really new there. Uh, you try to get every, something from both sides. For me, the interesting thing is uh, something that actually spans further throughout the Indian Ocean, actually, which is more and more in the domestic politics of each of these countries, one major dividing line is who is pro-China and who is not pro-China. And that, for me, is really interesting because it, it seems to be kind of Cold War kind of politics again. You look at, say, you look at uh, Mauritius, uh, sorry, uh, Maldives, you look at Sri Lanka, to some extent Nepal, there are parties on different sides of this divide. Who is more pro-China, who is less pro-China, right? And you see domestic politics being patterned around this pro-China, anti-China, pro-BRI, not pro pro So again, India and China increasingly will get involved in the domestic politics of these countries. As you see, I mean, you saw the Sri Lanka case, the flipping of one and the other. So I, I don't see why how this will change. It's just... At, at some point, maybe for three or four years, there'll be a regime that might be more pro-China. And then another regime, another government will come that will be more pro-India. They will, India and China will compete, try to throw money at them, diplomatic support at them. It will cycle going round and round. It's happening throughout the Indian Ocean, I think. That's, and that's a very interesting case to study, I think, I think. A proper study of how domestic politics is patterned increasingly along pro- and anti-China lines. But thanks, Devo. Thanks, Sindhapal. Amitendu, please. Diego, I think uh, Modi, for the remaining part of this uh, tenure that he has in Modi 2.0, is actually likely to be much more blunt on economic reforms than he was on the first occasion. And there are two reasons that I think will uh, influence that thinking. Firstly, I think he doesn't have to worry about a political fallout of difficult and tough economic policies. In fact, if those policies are not complemented by the state governments, to give an example, if the amendments in the Essential Commodities Act are not backed by states by bringing in changes in their agricultural marketing laws, the blame gets passed on to the states. Modi doesn't have to fear a political fallout. Most importantly, in the areas where Modi can make an impact in terms of central government policies, again, to give an example, if one looks at the ease of doing business, India ranks fourth globally when it comes to protecting the rights of minority investors. But it is beyond 100 when it comes to getting electricity permits. The difference between these two is that electricity permits are essentially those that are handled by the states. And it is the local level 
civic agencies and public utilities that needs to come up and perform. Whereas at the central level, when it comes to something like capital market protection measures and investor protection, it can very easily be done within the small gamut of executive decision making. So my sense is Modi will push ahead on economic reforms. But having said that, there are not really a great number of economic reforms which he has to carry out at his end because most of the onus the difficult economic policies left to be under are at the levels of individual state governments. But when it comes to issues like whether the Air India needs to be fully privatized or such measures, then it will require a certain degree of political courage on his part, which I think might be available in greater supply over the next three years as opposed to what it was earlier. Thank you, Amitandu and Rona Joy. The floor is yours to conclude. A very, very brief response. Uh, I think on the question of, uh, of, of federalism and uh, you know the, the relationship between the states and the center, uh, as Amitindu mentioned, I think in, in his comments, uh, the states are already and going ahead going to be severely uh, uh, cash strapped. And that's going to have an enormous impact on the relationship between uh, the states and the center. And this is going to be, I think, a story that uh, will be sort of omnipresent in the next uh, four years of, of Modi 2.0. Uh, and the second part of the question, which I don't know whether you asked, but I can sort of see it in the in the chat function, is whether sort of uh, even in the midst of the coronavirus, whether sort of politics as normal uh, will continue. And I think that is, you know, we are already seeing. I think there was a, a temporary sort of abatement. Uh, of politics uh, during the lockdown phase, um, from you know between say March to to May, but we are seeing we are seeing politics as usual sort of returning, and I think uh, the the BGP will you know try and and and, and uh, engineer something in in Maharashtra in the days ahead. Um, that's not um, um, you know. Um, that's very much possibility. We're also seeing in Gujarat where, where there are a, a, a couple of Rajya Sabha seats up for grab and the elections coming up. We already see, have seen a few Congress legislators um, having resigned and, and defected. So I think the usual sort of politics as usual, I think we are seeing again a quick return, uh, um, which uh, for a while I think was was not there. So I think um, the, these these trends will continue. Thank you, Rona Joy, and uh, thank you to all the three of you for being with us today, and um, thank you for all the uh, audience uh, who pose question, who listen to this discussion on Modi 2.0. It's uh, time to wrap up. Uh, please, um, if you have, if you are not already in our mailing list, uh, please um, uh, go to our website uh, and uh, join it. We hold a lot of um, very interesting events uh, freely available throughout the world, given the situation. So uh, this is certainly an occasion for people outside of Singapore uh, to know us better. So thank you to all of you, and um, I'll see you next time. <laughs>